Hello students, welcome to the answer writing program. Today we will be discussing two questions from disaster management, GS3, disaster and disaster management and one topic from the current affair. Let's take an overview of all the three questions. The first question is related to cloudburst and the measures that can be taken to mitigate the impact of cloudburst. The second is with respect to the earthquake and the NDMA guidelines with respect to earthquake. And the third, which is of current affair question, is regarding the delays in the judicial appointments. So let's start with the first question. Explain the reasons behind the increasing intensity of cloudburst and how it raises the disaster vulnerability of the region. So this would be the first demand of the question that we have to tell that reasons behind increasing intensity of cloudburst. Then in the second demand, discuss the measures that can be taken to mitigate the impact of cloudburst. So the measures to mitigate the impact of cloudburst with respect to the disaster management in India. So these would be the two demands of the question. So let's start with the intro. In intro, it can be the definition based that what is the cloudburst means the definition of the cloudburst. So the cloudburst is the sudden downpour or the unexpected precipitation exceeding 10 cm in an hour over the geographical region of approximately 20 to 30 km square. So this is the definition of cloudburst. So you can start with the definition based intro. Then next move on to the body part. What are the reasons behind the increasing intensity of cloudburst? The very first reason is the impact of climate change. Climate is changing. Global warming means the rise in the global temperature. And also the weather pattern or the precipitation patterns is also changing. So this means the air is getting warmer and the warm air holds more and more water. It means there is increased moisture content in the air which leads to the rainfall in the shorter duration for the shorter duration but with the huge intensity which can lead to the cloud burst. So the very first impact is due to the climate change. Then next is the monsoon variability. Again the changing patterns of the monsoon, delayed monsoon, or the prolonged monsoon which increases the moisture in the air again which leads to the shorter duration rainfall but the very intense rainfall so these are some reasons behind the increasing intensity of the cloudburst question is not asking about why the cloudburst happen question is about why the cloudburst intensity is getting increasing so these are the two points for that. Next is we need to write the disaster vulnerability raised by cloudburst. It means vulnerability means the proneness or the susceptibility. It means the cloudburst has happened. Now what is the susceptibility or the proneness or the vulnerability of that particular region uh, regarding the disaster? The first is cloudburst increases or raised the disaster vulnerability of the region because of its characteristic because of its characteristics of the cloudburst like cloudburst occurs suddenly and with the very intense rainfall so it leaves no time for the preparedness and evacuation so this increases the vulnerability of the region or it increases the impact on that particular region the second is cloudburst increases the disaster vulnerability due to the secondary hazards caused by cloudburst. Like once the cloudburst has happened, it means intense rainfall in the shorter duration, in the shorter area. It leads to the secondary hazards like flash floods, like landslides, like land subsidence. 
So this is the major disaster, but due to cloud burst, these secondary hazards happen. And this rapid flow of the water or the land subsidence or the land slides, the vulnerability of the region is increasing. Then next is the vulnerability of the region due to cloud burst is also increasing or is also raised because the hilly regions infrastructure is unprepared means the infrastructure is not resilient to tackle the impact of the cloud burst. This exacerbates the vulnerability of the region. So these are few points related to the disaster vulnerability raised by cloud burst. The next is mitigating cloud burst impact through the disaster management means what are the measures we can mitigate or reduces the impact of the cloud burst. The very first thing is the early warning system. Although cloud burst is very difficult to predict or forecast because of its very unusual characteristics like it is the it happens during the, the convergence of multiple meteorological conditions. So it doesn't depend on just the rainfall that it is getting orographically elevated or what. It is the convergence of the multiple meteorological conditions. So it is very difficult to predict. But with the high technology, huge investments in the high graded early warning system, we can try to forecast the cloud burst. Then next is the use of the Doppler radars. Doppler radars also can be used in forecasting the cloud burst for the very shorter area and that too like approximately 6 to 12 hours in prior in advance. Then next is community awareness in the training with respect to the cloud burst preparedness and evacuation and the survival skills. Next is capacity building capacity building of local government, national disaster management teams, community who are involved in the management of the evacuation and the preparedness methods. Then strengthened infrastructure. Strengthened infrastructure means like cloud burst, it means the intense rainfall. So what are the infrastructure related to the support or the uh, prevention of these rainfall getting into the disaster like embankments, barrages and the dams. So these are the infrastructure that should be properly maintained so as to take care of the excess rainfall so as not to overflow and to uh, flood the city. Then next is the rainwater disposal. Again, the huge accumulation of the water should be drained off with the proper drainage network. So the drainage connectivity, underground drainage should be properly maintained. Then next is the soil stability. Soil stability via afforestation, via vegetation cover. So this reduces the soil erosion. It increases the water retention capacity of the soil. We can also promote the stability of the topography via eco-friendly tourism and various other methods so as to stabilize the topography of that particular region so that the proneness or the vulnerability towards the disaster should be reduced. Then next is these are the preparedness measure. These are the response measure. Evacuation and preparation like now the cloud burst has happened or is about to happen like via the Doppler radars we know that within the next 6 to 12 hours the cloud burst is about to happen. So the evacuation and the preparedness for that particular disaster like shifting of the population or the habitations from valleys to some stable ground like the hills or the hard rocks. Then next is the rehabilitation program once everything is over properly rehabilitation for the sustainable livelihoods. So these are some mitigation cloud burst uh, methods impact through the disaster management. Finally conclusion you can write the summary that the cloud burst mitigation uh, efforts not only requires the single thing that about the stabilize of the topography or the capacity building but it requires a multifaceted approach which involves the suitable climate actions, land use planning and a proper disaster preparedness. These are some essential things 
so as to mitigate the impact of the cloud burst. So this way we are completed with the first question. Now let's see the model answer. The definition of the cloud burst, reasons, then disaster vulnerability due to the cloud burst and the measures that can be taken to mitigate the impact of cloud burst. Finally, concluding it with the cloud burst can be bracketed with the floods, landslides and the cyclones so as to properly manage them it should be planned and implemented in the time bound manner. So this completes the first question. Now let's move on to the second one. Explain the natural and the anthropogenic factors that render certain regions in India susceptible to earthquake. It means we need to tell that earthquakes causes natural as well as the anthropogenic. Also highlight the key components of the earthquake management strategy as outlined by NDMA. So this would be the first demand. The second demand would be NDMA guidelines with respect to earthquake. So in introduction, you can start with the definition of earthquake that earthquake is violent or sudden shaking of ground. Why? due to release of the pent up energy from the earth's interior. So earthquake can be caused by natural as well as the human causes. But you can also write in the introduction that the tectonic earthquakes are the most disastrous and the destroyable as compared to the earthquakes which are linked to the volcanic eruptions, landslides, land subsidence etc. So this way you can start the introduction and maintain the flow towards the earthquake causes. In the body part, natural causes of the earthquake. First is plate tectonic interactions. Earthquake occurs along the plate tectonic boundaries or when the plate interacts with one another. So for that we should know how the plates interacts. First the plate interact in the convergent manner then plate boundaries interact at the divergent boundary and the third is when the two plates are making transform boundary when the plates just pa slips past one another not converging not diverging so plate when converging it means first the plate is getting collided and then it's subducting. So while converging or the while the convergent boundaries are about to happen, earthquake happens or occurs during collision or during subduction. Then plate boundaries interact on the divergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries means making faults, rift valleys, and the mid oceanic ridges. So the pent up energy or the fault lines or the energy along the fault lines get released in the form of the earthquake waves. Then last is the transform boundary. When the two plates slide past one another, it means they are getting making the friction with one another. So again, earthquake waves. Then next is the volcanic activity. Earthquake can also happen with the active volcanic uh, volcanism. Next is the anthropogenic causes of the earthquake. First is a reservoir induced seismicity. So the earthquake occurs along the or nearby the large dams or the reservoirs. Why? Because the construction of the large dams or the reservoir alters the landmass distribution which forces the landmass or the plates to resettle which leads to the movement of landmass or the plates which causes the seismic waves or the seismic activity. Next is mining. Mining means the extraction of the material, mining of the material and while mining or the digging of the earth it causes the instability in the ground which causes the tremors. Last is explosions. Explosions, nuclear explosion, any explosion uh, on the land or the water can induce the tremors. So these are some anthropogenic causes of the earthquake. Next is the NDMA guidelines with respect to the earthquake. 
फर्स्ट अर्थक्विक रिजिलियंट डिजाइन एंड कंस्ट्रक्शन मीन्स द बिल्डिंग ऑफ इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर और कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ बिल्डिंग्स एंड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर विथ सम मटीरियल एंड विथ द डिजाइन बोथ शुड बी अर्थक्विक रिजिलियंट so the construction of the buildings and the infrastructure with the material and the design so as to withstand the earthquake means it should take tackle the earthquake activities or the earthquake forces then next is the regulation and the enforcement so the strict enforcement of the law and of the building codes while the construction of the buildings and the other infrastructure next is the seismic strengthening and the retrofitting so first we need to identify and reinforce the vulnerable infrastructure or the vulnerable structures and retrofit them with the seismic resilient or the earthquake resilient technologies next is public awareness and the preparedness so impacts of the earthquake and how to do the preparedness evacuation should be educated to the public or the community next is the capacity building capacity building for the earthquake means a multiple thing like there should be the huge investment in the r&d so as to adapt the technologies which are earthquake resilient we should also train the engineers and the building or the construction professionals then next is we should take the best practices uh, globally like from the japan what we can take the buildings and the bridges in japan are constructed or designed with the earthquake resilient technologies like the base isolation system and the energy dissipation devices so we should also use this technologies to build and design our infrastructure and the buildings then next is the earthquake response so the earthquake response should be coordinated prompt and efficient how it can be done via capacity building of the response team national disaster team members or the personals or the community personals who are involved in the management so these are the ndma guidelines next is the conclusion we can write the summary or the importance of the earthquake management so earthquake is unpredictable and destructive of all the natural hazards so we cannot control it but we can we can reduce the impact of the earthquake via proper management via following the ndma guidelines by capacity building of the communities of the personals and also by enforcing the proper or the standardized building codes so this way you can write the summary in the conclusion let's see the model answer first the definition based intro about the earthquake then natural causes of earthquake then anthropogenic causes then it shows the vulnerability of the earthquake in india like this is the very high vulnerable zone this is the high vulnerability then less than very low so the key components of the earthquake ndma guidelines so this way we are completed with second question let's move on to the third one delay in the judicial appointments not only increases the pendency of cases but also hampers the overall judicial functioning discuss so what is question saying that delay in judicial appointments not only increases the pendency of cases but also hampers the overall judicial functioning so we have to write how we need to discuss we'll write some recommendations also that how we can reduce the delays in the judicial appointments so in introduction you can start with the providing statistics or the process of the judicial appointment then you can connect that why there is a delay in the judicial appointments so 
with the statistics you can write about the vacancies that in the high courts approximately 340 vacancies are there in the supreme court two vacancies are there or you can also write about the pendency of the cases that in the supreme court approximately 70000 cases are pending high courts all the high courts together they uh, make 58 lakh pending cases in the subordinate co courts 4 crores cases are there which are pending or you can also write about the process of the judicial appointment that the judges of the supreme court are uh, appointed by the president after the due consultation with the cgi and the other senior judges or like that and you can connect with why there is a delay in the judicial appointments now let's come to the body part so we need to write about the two things these parts so the implications of the delayed appointments the very first is increased pendency of the cases when the judicial uh, positions are vacant judicial positions are vacant it means very fewer judges are handling the workload it means it reduces the efficiency of those existing judges and also it makes the proceedings slower and delayed judgments so if the judgments are delayed it means that case is still pending in the court it means the pendency of the cases are increasing the next one is the impact on the access to justice so the delayed appointment or the vacancies it hinders the access to timely justice or it also increases the time to resolve the cases so the delayed appointment of the vacancies it increases the time to resolve the cases because there are lesser judges in the courtrooms so it increases the judgment time it hampers access to timely justice and we know that delayed justice is denied justice and also it creates the frustration and the irritation in amongst the public and it also reduces the public trust in the judicial process the next is the talent drain how talent drain when there are the delays in the processing of the recommendations it leads to the talent drain in the judiciary itself it means the candidates who have given their candidature they are withdrawing their candidature it further exacerbate two things first it reduces the skilled pool in judges in judicial appointments which reduces the efficiency of overall judicial system and second when there are more withdrawals it means it exacerbates the vacancies it means increasing the workload on the judicial officers which are there in the courtrooms again delayed justice delayed judgments it means the rising pendency of the cases so the next one is the under utilization of the resources because the courtrooms are not utilized as per the uh, number of the appointments that courtroom can accommodate so there are the under utilization of the resources it means the efficiency of the courtrooms are getting incre uh, reduced it hampers the overall judicial uh, functioning so these are some implications of the delayed appointments the next is the recommendations for the judicial appointments you can write about the judges association versus union of india 1992 case in this supreme court has recommended the central government to appoint all india judicial services to streamline the process of the appointment and also to increase the overall functioning of the judicial system because it will do the standard rec uh, recruitment process or the centralized recruitment process the second is related to the 15th finance commission and the india justice report 2020 these have suggested that there are very less funds allocated for the appointment so these are su uh, suggesting that 
there should be increased funding for the appointments as well as the overall improvement in the justice system. Next is about the law commission. Law commission is suggesting so as to increase the number of judges per population. Now it is 21 judges per 10 lakh population and the law commission is suggesting it to increase to 50 per 10 lakh population. So these are some recommendations for the judicial appointment. Finally in the conclusion you can write about the summary that there are some negative effects what we have read in the main body that there are the if, uh, impacts of the delays in the judicial appointments. So to ensure the efficacy of the judiciary the delays in the appointments should not be uh, so procrastinated. Uh, it erodes the trust in the judiciary. So now it calls for the holistic view and the reforms to maintain the rule of law and the good governance. So this way we have completed our third question as well. So let's see the model answer. Third question it's starting with the concerns Supreme Court is expressing and also about some cases pending in the Supreme Court or you can also write about the process of the uh, judges appointment. Then implications of delay in the judicial appointment, finally conclusion, uh, recommendation and finally conclusion. So this way we have completed the third question as well. Thank you and have a nice day.